Hi friends, this is a bit of a pre-service edition, so if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to light our candle of hope. We've just finished our prayer meeting, and, and during that prayer meeting I just felt called to uh, spend a bit of time lighting our candle of hope. While we were praying, Elaine specifically asked us to pray for people who were on their own during lockdown. And you know, the Lord knows how hard it is. He knows how difficult things are when you're on your own during this lockdown period. But let me share this morning that the Lord brings you hope. Hope for better days. Hope for a turnaround. Hope for a breakthrough. And I just want to preach a word of hope to you this morning. You know, hope means having a reason for believing that something good might happen. Having a reason for believing that something good might happen. Friends, we have every reason to believe that something good might happen. We're closer to a breakthrough than we ever have been in the last 12 months. So I just pray for you this morning and I ask that the Lord will keep you uh, strong in faith. That you will live in hope. You see, we will see a breakthrough. I'm believing for a better year. So be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you. You know, when we light a candle in a dark room, it fills the room. And so this morning, my prayer is that the Lord will fill your house, will fill your room with the light of his presence. And that you will really sense the Lord at your side through these really difficult times. But hang in there, keep the faith, live in hope. We will see breakthrough. We're closer than ever before. I'm believing it will be this year. So be strong and courageous. And the second thing I'd like to share before we begin our service as, as an addition really, is that while we were praying, the Lord gave me a word of prophecy for someone. You know, I just want to share this now. and I believe that God has a plan for the new before he lets go of the old. God has a future in store uh, and he, he's, it's already mapped out before he asks us to let go of the past. But this is the word of prophecy. I believe that the Lord is asking someone to let go of something. The Lord wants you to let go. He wants you to, the Lord wants to give you something. I believe the Lord is saying that I've got something for you. I've got something that I want to give you, but I can't because your hands are already full. You know, while ever there's already something in our hands, the Lord can't give us what he wants to give us. And if we're holding on to something, the Lord can't, uh, we can't receive what the Lord has for us when we have something in our hands already. So I ask you this morning to seek the Lord uh, because when the Lord asks you to let go of something, it's because he wants to replace it with something else. And I believe that there's one or more people here listening today where the Lord is saying, let go, I've got something to give you, but your hands are full. So I, I just ask you to take a minute to seek the Lord, to see if this is a word for you. Because if it is a word for you, and if you respond to what the Lord is saying, yes, you might have to let go of something, something that you don't particularly want to have to let go of. But when you do let go, the Lord can give you what, what it is that he wants you to receive. And what he has for you will far exceed the thing that you're hanging on to. So just take a minute to see if that's a word for you this morning. The Lord bless you. Welcome to Sunday Church Online. It's great to be with you again for our Lent season. To this Today is the first Sunday of Lent. And uh, so after a time of worship and breaking bread together, Mark Tennyson is going to uh, give us an overview of uh, what Jesus shared with the crowds and taught his disciples on uh, the hillside in the Sermon on the Mount. 
And so Mark's going to be uh, introducing the theme of the Beatitudes. And that's uh, the Beatitudes are what we're going to uh, focus on for the next uh, four Sundays leading up to Palm Sunday and Easter Day. So I trust that you have a great service with us today and uh, really enjoy this uh, theme that we're sharing with you. So, hello everybody. Um, when Ashley asked me to sing today, um, I always get a bit nervous and in the morning when I walk the dogs, I always go around the, uh, the graveyard and I find a lot of peace there and that's where I say my prayers out loud and that's where I talk to Jesus. And I was walking around and I just thought, what song can I sing that, you know, I can sing well? Because um, I don't know many. Uh, and then I just suddenly thought, hang on a minute, Linda, it's not all about you. It's about Jesus. It's to glorify Jesus, not to glorify you. And so I, I prayed on it and I, and I did say, Jesus, you know, I need you to tell me which song you want me to sing. Because I do want to glorify you more than I want to glorify me. And before I actually finished saying that, this thought popped into my head and it was more of you, less of me. And I thought, that's it, that's the song that I'm going to have to sing. So I decided to sing that, but then Ashley said, oh, I'll let you know which songs I want you to sing, if, you know, come to an agreement sort of thing. And I thought, oh, flipping heck. Anyway, the only other song that I know very well is the one that Jane sang yesterday, Raise a Hallelujah. So anyway, Ashley sent me a message this morning and said, how about singing these two songs? And as soon as he said this first song, I thought, that's it. This is what Jesus wants me to sing. So here goes, this is for Jesus. You came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status. Says nothing. The King of all kings came to serve, washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you is less of me, take everything off. All of you is all. Desires and dreams I lay down Here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down If more of you is less of me Take everything Yes, all of you is all I need Take everything, oh Lord, change me like only you can, here with my heart in your hands, Father I pray make me more like Take everything, cause all of you is all I need. Take everything, if more of you means less of me. Take everything, if more of you means less of me. Take everything. 
Linda, thank you for leading us in worship um, and for introducing the song, More Like Jesus. You know, our theme for today is the Beatitudes, the Be Attitude. Uh, what an incredible uh, song it, it, it is that goes with our theme of being more like Jesus. Trust you enjoyed our worship. Before we hear the word of God today, let's just break bread together. Good morning everybody. It's a real honour and a privilege to conduct this communion service this morning. And as we come together, we come together in unity. And that's the theme of the, this communion service this morning. Communion is not a ritual that is performing an act for the sake of it, but an act of coming together in unity. At the Last Supper, Jesus, uniting his disciples and all his followers' sins, when he said, as often as you come together, just repeat that, as often as you come together. So as we come together, even though we're in our own homes, we're still able to come together through the wonders of technology and join with Jesus and in fellowship with each other as a community. As Jesus invites us to a supper this morning, we remember his sacrifice for us. It is also an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus, who has promised to be with us, always, even to the end of the age. Jesus often used everyday examples to get this point across to those who were following him, and using bread and wine as an example 
should not diminish the significance of symbols representing his impending sacrifice on the cross. So this morning we remember his body broken for us and his blood shed for us and are reminded that we cannot earn our salvation. I'm going to read to you now from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So let's just take a moment to examine ourselves. And then, if you get your bread and your wine, then we'll break bread together in unity. So let's just take a moment to examine ourselves. So, if you'd like to take your bread, <clears throat> Jesus said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break bread together. And then Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. So let's drink and remember. O oh Lord Jesus, what a sacrifice, what a saviour. Lord, we do thank you this morning. Thank you that, for everything that you've done for us. And Lord, thank you that you've called us to be in service for you and in unity. So Lord, bless each one who has taken the emblems this morning. And, uh, and may we be worthy of the name Christian. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. So let's just pray for Mark as he brings the word of God to us. Lord, I thank you for the time and energy that's gone into preparing the word of God this morning. And I know that Mark will have sought your heart and will be bringing uh, the words that you want us to hear. So I pray that as uh, your people will, will be open and receptive their hearts will be uh, ready to hear from the Word of God this morning. And uh, Lord, I pray this might be a life-changing um, experience for us as we come together around your Word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, Church. It's really good to be sharing the Word of God with you this morning. You know, just before Christmas, it was announced that in the new year, we will be launching a series of talks about living holy lives. And today we're going to launch that series of talks. And you know, these talks on holy living 
are going to be rooted in the Beatitudes, which form part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes being God's perfect and most wonderful standards for holy living and discipleship. And so over the next few weeks, our talks on living holy lives will cover two of the Beatitudes listed in Matthew's Gospel per week, which will neatly take us up to Palm Sunday, Holy Week and of course Easter. And so today's talk serves as an introduction, an, an overview if you like, to our series of talks on holy living using the Beatitudes as our core teaching. So in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, where we are able to read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has just started his earthly ministry and is in the region of Galilee. Jesus has been through the temptations in the wilderness and has been busy calling his disciples, preaching, healing the sick and casting out demons. So by this time, Jesus is already attracting large crowds and they're wanting more. Crowds of people hungry, excited and eager to hear what Jesus has to say. And at the start of Matthew chapter 5, the passage tells us that Jesus positions himself at the top of a hill in order to deliver his famous sermon. It doesn't say which hill, just that it was a hill. But in some versions of the Bible, hill translates as mountain. And the fact that Jesus chooses to speak at this high level is, I believe, significant for two reasons. Firstly, and strategically, Jesus' choice of location is absolutely brilliant. And I say that because the hills around the Sea of Galilee rise to almost 1,400 feet above sea level, which meant that Jesus' words would carry and be clearly audible over some distance to many, many people. And you know, Jesus was absolute genius at communicating the gospel as effectively as possible, as quickly as possible, and to as many people as possible. And I think there are real lessons and challenges for the church here, for us to be as creative as we possibly can be in spreading the gospel as quickly as we can, as effectively as we can, and to as many people as we can. So first of all, Jesus positioning himself on the hillside or on the mountainside is absolute genius. But also, and I believe even more significantly, Jesus is choosing the high ground with his listeners below him is highly symbolic. I believe that it's a reminder that God and God's standards, God kingdom standards, are over and above our own standards, are over and above all things, that he is sovereign over all. I believe that Jesus at the top of the hill and the people at the bottom below him is a reminder of our fallen and lowly state and of the holiness and the righteousness of God and how we must look up and fix our eyes on Jesus who alone is able to raise us up out of the pit that we are in in order to share his glory. And I was reminded, I was preparing this sermon, I was, I was reminded of Psalm 121 and I, I wonder whether that psalm prophetically points to Jesus on the hillside because it starts by saying, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh even from the Lord who has made heaven and earth. So the people who are below Jesus are having to look up on the hillside to see him and to hear him. And as they look up, where does their help come from? Where their help comes from the Lord. And who is the Lord but Jesus Christ? So I just love that psalm and I just believe that that's a prophetic word that's pointing us to Jesus Christ. That we have to look up, keep our eyes firmly fixed on him because he is the source of our salvation and everything that we need. You know, after positioning himself on the hill, Jesus then starts to teach the crowd and he begins his sermon by giving us the Beatitudes. Now the word Beatitude, it comes from the Latin word Beatitudo, which means blessedness. And in the King James Version of the Bible and in other versions, such as the New International Version 
and the Amplified Bible. Each beatitude begins with the word blessed. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the humble, blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of the kingdom. And in Jesus' day, the word blessed and the expression blessed are those held a very powerful meaning. It was a meaning of divine joy and perfect happiness. So when Jesus is saying, blessed are those, Jesus is saying divinely happy and fortunate are those who possess these inner qualities. To be blessed in this way is actually to be in a state of bliss and amazing favour. But then it gets even better, because with each of these inequalities comes the promise of a reward. So to those who recognise their spiritual poverty belongs the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn now will receive God's comfort. Those who are humble will inherit the earth. Those who thirst for righteousness shall be filled. The merciful will be shown mercy, and the pure in heart will see God. The peacemakers will be known as God's children. And for those who are persecuted for the sake of the kingdom belongs the kingdom of heaven. And great will be their reward in heaven. So Jesus is saying that for those who demonstrate these divine inequalities comes an absolutely great life and a glorious future. Now that's really encouraging, yeah? it's wonderful, it's great news, but you can imagine that when the crowd first heard Jesus preach these words, they would have thought that Jesus was setting a seemingly impossible standard, because Jesus is telling us how we ought to live, he's telling us how we ought to be in life. And if you enjoy a play on words, you could say that these standards are our how-to-be attitudes. And you know, in this passage, Jesus is turning ordinary human ideas about what counts in life completely upside down. Because these beatitudes, these divine standards, they're not natural to the human spirit. They're just not natural to the flesh. You see, contrary to popular and general opinion, it's not the go-getters, the tough ones, the ones who bend the rules who are the real successors. The truly blessed are those who recognise the spiritual poverty of self-reliance and learn to depend wholly on God. Everything else of real importance and value follows on from this. Everything else takes its proper place. So the people who can be certain of a glorious future are the humble, the forgiving, the pure, those who set their hearts on what is right and try to heal rifts, hurts and divisions. Those who put the seasoning into life. Those who are the salt for the whole human race, as Jesus puts it. Those who light up the way. The people who Jesus describes as light for the whole world. Now Jesus knows that we are not going to be able to live such holy lives by simply trying to follow a set of rules and divine standards. It's just not going to happen. You know, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, the chosen people, were given the Mosaic Law as a minimum perfect standard to live by. But of course they fell woefully short, time after time after time, because living by the law only served to remind them about how sinful they were. So if Jesus is simply asking us to live up to a divine set of standards, then all he is doing is mocking us, because we can't do it. We just cannot reach that standard required. We're just going to end up feeling guilty, and we're just going to end up in despair. No, Jesus knows that to live holy lives and to demonstrate these inequalities is going to require an inner revolution of attitude and outlook. In other words, spiritual regeneration and ongoing transformation in our lives and a willingness to be transformed. 
on an ongoing basis. Now this spiritual regeneration and this ongoing transformation is only possible by faith in Jesus Christ. Spiritual regeneration and ongoing transformation is only possible when we repent and we accept Jesus as Lord and Saviour and receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. Who is the mark or the stamp of God's ownership on us? Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 says, And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people and this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. And in John's Gospel chapter 14 verse 6 Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So the scriptures are letting us know, Jesus is letting us know that salvation and spiritual regeneration is only possible through faith in him. Jesus Christ, God's perfect standard. It is not in our own power or strength that we are able to live out the Beatitudes. You see, the glorious thing is that having set a seemingly impossible standard to live by, Jesus gives us the power to turn the impossible into reality. Because kingdom standards and kingdom values require kingdom power. And in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus reminds us that what gives life is God's spirit. Human power is of no use at all. If we try and follow these standards in our own strength, in our own power, we're just going to get nowhere and we're going to fall woefully short. But if we recognise that we are reliant on the power of God, on the Holy Spirit, then we can be confident that these inequalities will be demonstrated in our lives. And you know, for those of us who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour, much is expected. The Lord expects that our lives, given over to him, freely given over to him, will demonstrate these divine standards in every area of our lives. These divine standards are not really about what we do so much as about who we are as a spiritually regenerated people, a born again people who are growing into the likeness of Christ on a daily basis. Yes, we can never be perfect in holiness in this life, but we can grow into greater holiness more and more every day and I believe are expected to do so. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it says, I have been put to death with Christ on his cross, so that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. The greater the demonstration of these divine inequalities in our lives, the greater the evidence of a life dying to self, of a life crucified with Christ and a life coming under the discipline of the Lord through daily submission and repentance. But you know also, these beatitudes, these divine standards, are not given as a kind of spiritual pick and mix so that we can choose or concentrate our attention on those we like the sound of the most or seem to be the easiest for us to accomplish. We are to embrace them all, because these divine standards cover every aspect of holy living. It doesn't matter what aspect of holy living you come up with and you mention. It doesn't matter how long the list. They all come under the umbrella of the Beatitudes. Embracing them all requires that we have both feet firmly planted in God's kingdom. In John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 16, when praying to his Heavenly Father, Jesus says, Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. 
By they, Jesus is, of course, referring to his followers. And as his followers, we are done with the flesh now and its worldly standards. We are for Christ and for Christ alone. And if we are not, then my question to you this morning is, what are we going to do about it? Because we need to do something about that if we're going to become more and more the people that God has called us to be. And so over the next few weeks, I want to encourage all of us to embrace this series of talks on the Beatitudes and to use this opportunity to reflect, to wait on the Lord, to repent, because these divine standards challenge us in the areas of self-reliance, indifference to the things of God and relationships, and to ask the Lord to release us into greater holiness and Christ-likeness. So may the Lord really bless you and open up your heart and mind to receive all he wants you to receive in the next few weeks as we look forward, as we look ahead to the glorious Easter tide. Amen. Thank you, Mark, for that great insight into the Sermon on the Mount, uh, a real unpacking of uh, the B attitudes. And we look forward to hearing from Glennis next week, who's going to be uh, sharing on our first two B attitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So we look forward to a, a um, church next week. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to go out uh, singing and rejoicing. The Lord bless you. I was contacted by Dawn Horrell last week and she was telling me about this great song that has been a real blessing to her, a real encouragement and a real strength in times that have been perhaps difficult. And uh, so we're going to close with an incredible song. And if, if it will, let's let's go out as we started on a on a on a, um, a note of being hopeful uh, for better days ahead and, and actually that recognizing that uh, no matter what we're going through, God is still God. So enjoy this. It's going to be a real blessing as we close with a song sang by Dawn Horrell. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a song. It's called You Still Reign and You're Still God by Philippa Hanna. I heard it. A um, friend of mine from South Africa put a link on Facebook and I heard the song and it's just really spoken to me and encouraged me and I'm hoping it'll do the same for, for you, although I can't see you at the moment, but I just pray that God would speak to you.
I'll trust the victory of the cross. 